what's this supposed to be? It's a fossil. Okay. A Martian fossil. Yeah, I get that because we're on Mars. Will, this fossil is proof of extraterrestrial life. Wait, so that means... Yeah. I'm gonna be rich. You're gonna be rich? Oh, yeah. Me, you too. Like famous, don't forget about famous. And we're gonna be knee-deep in money and hot women. When did you dig this out? That's just it. It wasn't me. Somebody else did it. Well, it probably just happened naturally, like an earthquake. I mean, Mars quake. I bet this is a security device. Some kind of laser tripwire. Ed, you're just being paranoid. Dead! Thompson, what's your status? Everything is under control. What do you mean, under control? I mean, I just shot one, and I'm fixing to shoot the other one. Fashioned internal combustion engine is still the way to go. In addition to gasoline, your vehicle needs its own oxygen supply because of the thin Martian atmosphere. People have asked for years, could there be life on Mars? Thanks to Interplanetary Corporation, the answer is now a resounding yes. Control. I'm ready to begin the docking maneuver. I'm performing a few last minute. <laughs> oh yeah, let me get rid of this. We're gonna have a hard time docking if you don't get out of those clothes. 
Sorry, honey. Not today. Just came to get the video equipment. Ooh, home movies? Think you can work that camera while you're working on my... Okay, seriously, I'm busy. I'll be back in a couple hours. I'll work on your ass then. Hey, is anybody awake? I'm awake, Lisa. Have you seen Will? Yeah, he's right here. Will? Michelle, why isn't Will answering? Oh, he was here. I guess he left. Stay right there and prepare for the docking maneuver. So Jackson, this coffee is terrible. Well, that's last night's coffee. So Jackson, I've been meaning to ask you, where are your time reports? What? Your time reports. The reports that break down what you work on each week by quarter hour. Tell you what. How about since I'm the cook, you put me down for cooking 30 hours every week? And then you can put me down for answering stupid questions another 10 hours every week. And if I need to allocate my hours any differently, at some point I'll let you know. Steve, can you help me install that security camera later? Okay. Thanks. You got anything you spank me with? Will! Oh, hey, babe. You're up early. Yeah, I've got a lot of surveying to do, just trying to get caught up. Where's Ed? Ed? Your assistant? Ed, yes, I sent Ed on out to set up some, um, some pre-surveying stuff. <laughs> scientific discovery in the history of the human race. And let me say that again so we're clear. The most important scientific discovery in the history of the human race. These are fossilized remains. A hand and part of an arm. That's a Martian hand. It's probably been here for thousands of years, maybe even millions. But it is proof that we are not alone in the universe. Or at least we haven't always been. Like I said, most important scientific discovery ever. With any luck, I'll be able to dig out the entire Martian fossil in the next couple of weeks. 
But in the meantime, if uh, anyone is interested in discussing movie rights or book deals, they can get in touch with my agent, my brilliant artist agency, through the book. Somebody there? Hey there, Mr. Frank. How'd you get yourself in there? So you told the guy? Yeah, so I told him, you need to cut that shit out, man, if you're gonna get rid of the tennis elbow. I, I don't get it. Tennis elbow, man. Tennis elbow. Shit, never mind. What are we doing here, Steve? Well, I'm about to go help Michelle install a security camera. Nah, man, I mean, what are we all doing here? You ever think about that? A company owns a permanent base on Mars, but all the employees are either management or support staff. What about Will and Ed? That's right. It's all support staff except for the guys out there looking for some place to build Mars Base 3, when they're really not doing anything with Mars Base 2. Whatever happened to Mars Base One? We well, I heard this is Mars Base One. But the marketing department got a focus group in and they like to the name Mars Base Two better. <laughs> Morning, Steve. Hey. Steve. Why is there a bra on the Mars model? I don't know, Lisa. Can you do something about the doors? Which doors? All of them. You know that noise they make, that... Mm. Could that be more of a swish? Like that old TV show? Star Trek? Yes. Don't you think that would sound better? Hey, man. Hey, let me ask you something. Yeah. I think I'd get caught if I snuck out late one night with a buggy. I didn't know you were such a rebel. I'm not going for a joyride. Picked up some radio signals a few miles from here, thinking it might be an old probe from Earth. Mars is a pretty big planet. Kind of weird that some relic from Earth would be right next door. Nah, I'm gonna check it out. Might be fun. Could use some company if you want to go. <laughs> you should take Michelle. She's the one with the space tech fetish. Oh, yeah, how do you know that? Me and her had a thing going for a while. And it didn't work out. Neither one of us were really lesbians. Hey, have you heard from Lori? Nope. She's supposed to call today about the new spot. Are we gonna fly in actors again? Of course. I'm not going to ruin a very important company campaign with amateur talent. Hmm. You know, we're probably gonna need to beef up security for that. So I was thinking, you wanna get together and work out the specs over dinner one night? Maybe Saturday? Kevin, you know Saturday is date night for Will and me. Yeah. Nothing. How about now? It's 
Still nothing. Steve, get up here and fix this stupid thing. I don't know why we're installing a security camera anyway. Hey, hey. Mars is one of the most dangerous planets in the solar system. We need like 11 cameras out there. Okay, that's, that's good, Steve. It's working. Who took out the buggy today? Nobody. That's still working on it. We got company. Let's see. There's not supposed to be anybody on Mars but us. Hey, the zoom on this camera isn't working. I don't think there is a zoom. You gotta be kidding me. I mean, this is a security breach. And we are now at a tactical disadvantage because our security camera does not have a zoom. Try and talk to him, Kevin. See if he can figure out what frequency he's on. Steve, Shell, maybe you guys should come back inside. Lock the door, Kevin. Hey, did something just explode? Kevin, I thought you just told me to come in. Lisa locked us down. Tell the to unlock us down. What's wrong with this radio? Wrong. Those beeps. Management puts profanity filters on all corporate communication devices. IMs, emails, radio, everything. Oh yeah. I read about that in the newsletter. has a gun. He was gonna shoot me. I doubt it.
Breakfast is ready. If anybody's hungry. <clears throat> Someone would let us out of this closet. Is anybody out there? Yeah, at least the lock is trashed. Is Steve there? Can you fix it? Maybe. You know, Lisa, I'm still a little pissed you left me outside to get blown up. Steve, I was just trying to follow procedure. Yeah, Steve, you... Shut up, Kevin. Steve, please, understand, I was just trying to do my job. Yeah. I'll go get some tools. Thanks, Steve. So what happened outside? Please tell me that son of a bitch Jackson got himself killed. Nah, he just saved Steve's life and took down Mr. Rocket Launcher guy. Whatever. You and Beth, suit up and go check out the crime scene. Okay. What are we looking for? Anything I might need to include in my report. What report? I don't know. A lost time accident report. A, an asshole with a rocket launcher report. Just go outside and look around and tell me what you find. I don't remember anything in my job description about investigating crime scenes. It's in your contract. Other duties and responsibilities as determined by management. Oh. That's how they get you. How's the rocket launcher guy? He's dead, Steve. Real dead. Why did Jackson learn to shoot like that? He used to work for the Texas Mafia. Really? Yeah. He doesn't like to talk about it, though. What was that about Texas? Nothing, Steve. Jackson is so stupid. He should have shot that guy in the kneecap. That's what I would have done. That way he'd still be alive, and we'd be able to question him. You know, it's, it's actually kind of cozy in here. You know, if I had to be trapped in any closet with anybody, I'm just glad I'm trapped here with you. What's the holdup out there? I'm going as fast as I can here, Lisa. Jones, how's the buggy? It's in worse shape than the dead guy. Are you gonna finish fixing this? Hey, man. Nobody eating breakfast? I, I guess not. Uh, I wanted to say thanks for saving my life a while ago. Yeah, no problem. Lisa and Kevin get out of the closet? Yeah, you know, the panel, you... Hi, this is Lisa at Mars Base 2. We've encountered a bit of a situation. We were attacked today by an unknown party, resulting in the death of an employee. Additionally, one of our team members threatened myself and my assistant with bodily harm and detained us against our will for several minutes. Terrible. I hate to bother you with this, but the corporate policies manual doesn't seem to cover either of these scenarios. I mean, I assume there will at least be some paperwork to be filled out, but, well, please advise. Thanks. Oh, also, I have an idea for a weekly television show that I think would be good for synergy with someone like Fox or HBO. It's edgy, and I'm working on a treatment at the moment, but I would love it if someone from marketing could give me a call about it. Where do you think you're going? 
I'm going to see if the guy that tried to blow us up this morning's got any friends. Steve picked up a radio signal a few miles out. No, we're going to sit tight until I hear back from Lori. And you're confined to quarters. Really, Jackson? Guns? Locking a superior in a closet? Destruction of company property? You're in a lot of trouble. Who the hell's Lori? Lori. Vice President of Off Earth Projects. My boss. Our boss. Haven't you seen the org chart? Okay. Here's the old man. I don't give two shits about the org chart or the old man, or what some bitch back on Earth has to say about the situation up here. And I don't think you'll be confining me to my quarters, or anywhere else, since I am the only guy in this hole with any guns. Maybe. Maybe not. You should have killed me when you had the chance, Jackson. Ow, shit! Hello, Steve. Uh, me and the doc decided I should go with you. Is that right? Well, I told him he should go in case that guy that blew up Michelle hurt anybody else. Look, I'm more concerned the guy that blew up Michelle is just the first in a long line of maniacs out to kill all of us. Doc said the same thing. And that you might need help with computers in case you find, like, an enemy base. Or... You realize Lisa's gonna fire you if you go? Well, I was thinking about that. Lisa almost got me killed this morning. I might be safer if I did get fired. Yeah. Put your helmet on. Is this thing loaded? That guy is such a hole. Jones. What's up? I still haven't heard back from corporate, but in the meantime, I need you to bring the bodies inside. Bodies? Yeah. Michelle, uh, John Deere. John Doe. Do we have a morgue? No. Well, I guess put the bodies on ice or something, and you might need to do autopsies on them. And I'm pretty sure we'll have to ship the bodies back to Earth at some point. Oh, and be sure to gather all the forensic evidence. I'll do it if you won't. But I think Kevin might be better suited to handle any forensics work. Why? Isn't Kevin the head of security? No, the company sent Kevin a head of security to do paperwork, risk analysis, stuff like that. Counting on you. Don't screw this up.
Hey, Will. With all the confusion, I forgot you were out there, man. Where's Ed? Will. Is your radio on? Do you want to come in? I take that as a yes. Would you help me? seem to be out of, you know, and I was wondering maybe if you could throw me a roll, please. Yo, Will. Jones, I need you to put these with the evidence. Lisa, about that. We're going to have to store these bodies for a while. We'd be better off if we leave them outside. But they'll rot. Actually, they won't. You see, there's no life on Mars. No kidding. What does that have to do with anything? Well, for decomposition to occur... Jones, we... I don't want these bodies left outside. And there's a staff meeting in five minutes. Mandatory. Hey, clean that up. Beth? Yeah? Can you find Ed? We need to get everyone together for a staff meeting. Hey, babe, you okay? Look, I really need for you to... Look, mister, I think you might be forgetting that I am still your...
about Michelle. Yeah. Everybody is. No. See, we had sex this morning. With each other. Steve, Michelle had sex with a lot of people. I mean, look, it's not like I'm judging her or anything. It's not like there's much else to do on this rock. You know, she and Beth were going at it for a while. So I heard. Yeah. I walked in on them a couple of times. Yeah, it was hot. Sorry, Will is under the weather. Beth, where are you? I'm looking for Ed. Where are you looking for Ed? I don't know, a couple of miles out from base. He didn't answer when I called him, so I tuned in his tracer and... And you just decided to go out looking for him? Hey, you know, it was your idea. You told me to go find Ed for the meeting. But the meeting's right now. So, do you want me to come back? No, go on and find Ed and try to make it back for at least some of the meeting. Sure. Hello? What are you doing here? The airlock was open, man. Yeah, it's always open. Zillion dollar spaceship, no lock on the front door. Go figure. Sorry. Can I take my helmet off?
You need to calm down. Move your hand. Steve, the hand, move it. No blood. It just grazed the suit. Hang on. Here we go. Fix it flat. What? One more time. No, wait, 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 wait. Um. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, it's not permanent, but, uh, It'll last you a couple of hours, maybe. How's your O2? We're good. All right. Here. <laughs> Steve. Don't point the gun at anything unless you intend to shoot it. Don't put your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot. You sure know a lot about guns. Were you in the military? Yeah. <laughs> no. What is she talking about? Turn on A and N. Who's A N? I have just made the most important scientific discovery in the history of the human race. Now let me say that again so we're clear. The most important scientific discovery in the history of the human race. Oh, <laughs> all news network. These are fossilized remains. A hand and part of an arm probably been here for thousands of years, maybe even millions. Unbelievable. We just received this video a few hours ago. While this may be an elaborate hoax, our technical experts believe that this is a message from Mars. That's the planet Mars. We have also confirmed that William Taylor of Atlanta, Georgia, is currently stationed on Mars. He is an employee of Interplanetary Corporation, Thus far, officials from Interplanetary on Earth have been unavailable for comment. William! You son of a bitch, get your ass out here right now! Do you hear me? Steve. Steve, this is Lisa. Come in, Steve.
need to answer me, you Please, Lisa, what? I need to get a door unlocked. A security override. A uh, security override, and Michelle's the only one that can do that. Michelle is dead, Steve. Yeah. Um... Mother... I'm not the one who blew her up. What? Yeah. Nothing. We got atmosphere now. Hey, Jackson? Is it true people really lose control of their bowels when they get killed? Lisa. What? I just wanted to let you know I found some slime. So? Well, I analyzed it and... You can analyze slime, but you can't do forensics? I found a machine to do it for me. Listen, the slime is biological, but it's not human. It's not Jones, that's great, but right now I have more pressing concerns than mystery slime. It just doesn't make any sense. If this is for real, why no word from Interplanetary? Well, I think it's obvious. Uh, this Will character has gone rogue. He's just gone over everybody's hey, head. Lisa! Okay, when are we gonna get back to the meeting? The meeting's over, Kevin. I want you and Jones to get into Will's room. He's in there and he won't come out and no one can override the door lock. How are we supposed to do that? Sledgehammer, crowbar, blowtorch, I don't know, whatever works. Just get him out of there, and when you do, bring him to me. Okay, all right, let me get this straight. Sledgehammer, crowbar. Now, if he resists, do I have permission to use Taekwondo? Sure, Kevin. Windows 98. This is fine. What's Windows 98? Old operating system from like 2003. Shouldn't be much of a problem. Looks like they printed out their emails. Some of them at least. What did they say? Nothing. A bunch of porn. We can't say shit over the radio, and they get to email porn? Chicks with dicks. Hey, baby, I think I'm gonna take a nap. Which one is she? It's Beth, the mechanic. She's cute for a grease monkey. Yeah, go take your nap. <laughs> you find a dildo on the way. So, you gonna shoot me? No, uh, I'll probably just tie you up or something after a while. Well, you know who I am. Guess you're Dave? Screw you, that's who I am. Could I have some of those? You kidding me? It's probably the last box of cheesy mega puffs on the whole planet. You want to try it? You know, you ladies need to find a hobby that didn't involve my dick.
Kevin, what are you doing? Hello? What? I, I said hello. I can barely hear you, Kevin. Where are you? Lisa, hey. I am so sorry. I was in the middle of something really big. You're supposed to be breaking into Will's room. Right, right. I know. I, I, absolutely. Jones, I need you to meet me outside Will's room in five minutes. And on the way, I need you to... Uh, I need you to pick up a sledgehammer, a crowbar, and a blowtorch. Yeah, can we just ask him nicely to come out? No. We're breaking in. It's Lisa's orders. I will see you in five. Better make that ten. Hey, Will, you in there, man? Will? Is that you out there? Don't take this personally, but me and Jones are about to break into your room. And about that little stunt that you pulled? Lori called. I think we're all fired. I mean, you could have at least... Occupado! Hey, if this is some kind of weird sex homo thing, I don't swing that way. What is your problem, man? Shit. I mean, this is some really, really good shit. I know. So, there's these guys I'm working with, and they've become really slack on the safety procedures. I just, we just had to get out of there. It's just a matter of time before some bad shit goes down. What'd you say you and your guys were working on? I didn't say. Because it's a secret. Jeff, this is Lisa. Where are you? Who said that? Oh, it's uh, my radio and my helmet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hey, Lisa. I've been captured. Captured? By who? Beck? Some guy... Dave. It's all right, though. I'm about to escape. Good. Well, while you're out looking for Ed, I need you to investigate any caves that you come across. Investigate for what? I'd rather not get into specifics right now. I think it'll be obvious when you see it. Lisa, won't you just tell me what I'm looking for? Beth, I am very busy right now, and 
I can't tell you what you're looking for because it's classified. Classified? Classified, need to know corporate information. If you find this thing, I'll give you an extra vacation day. Oh, well, that'll be great. Yeah, because the only thing more boring around here than work is a day off. Jones, did you find Will? Did you get into his room yet? He's not in his room. Did you check his tracer? Yes, it isn't working. I guess you and Kevin will have to do a manual search for him. Okay. Tell Kevin to meet me in the lab. I thought he was with you already. No, he never showed up. I did find some blood, but I think it's just from Frank. Who's Frank? Frank the cat. We have a cat? Not anymore. Hey, Jackson. What's today? I don't know. They're all starting to run together. No, I mean the date. Um, September 1st. I found a list with all our names on it. It says we're supposed to be dead by today. Well, they ain't over yet. Who's been awfully quiet regarding this Mars... Breaking news. Regarding the Mars story, or the Mars hoax as it now appears, we just received this report from WCLM, one of our Mississippi affiliates. Police raided this house and arrested Pinson resident C. Charles at approximately 3.45 this afternoon on charges of fraud. An internal audit of several interplanetary corporation technical systems led officials to the suspect. First off, I'd like to apologize to the public on behalf of Interplanetary. Apparently this Charles character staged his elaborate video that hacked into our Mars communication satellite so that the video appeared to be generated from the Red Planet. At this moment, we're working to improve security protocols company-wide. We were able to get a brief comment from Charles. This is retarded. I'm not a hacker. I don't even, I don't even own a computer. I don't even look like that Mars guy. I'm like a foot taller than him. Oh, son of a... What did you do? Steve? I think I underestimated their security system. Look under the keyboard. What are you, psychic? Student of human nature. Oh, come on. Steve? Yeah. Can we get out of here? I'm starting to think this whole place is going to self-destruct or something. Maybe I can find a switch and get the main power back online. Hey, Steve. Maybe you should get down here. I thought we were leaving. As soon as you see this.
happened to Dick? Live call? Where are you? I'm en route to Mars. I... Wh why wasn't I informed if I'd known you were... It was supposed to be a surprise. Surprise? Lori, do respect, but this is highly unusual. I know, and as much as I hate to ruin the surprise, I wanted to call and apologize for my previous message. Uh, apologize? Yes, I... Overreacted. I just found out the whole thing was a hoax. Yeah, I, I saw that on the news. Great. Well, again, all apologies. See you soon. Okay. Did you get my message about... Beth? Come in, Beth. What? I just got a call from Lori. She apologized to me. Okay. No, not okay. Lori doesn't apologize to anyone. Something strange is going on. It's got something to do with that cave. Let me call you back, Lisa. I can't hear you. It's probably something to do with this cave. Sanchez. You are? Lori, you idiot. I thought you guys were taking care of the security breach. Security breach? Yeah, that Mars Base 2 idiot found the dig site, or didn't you hear? Dig site? Yes, the dig site. Sanchez, are you getting paid to repeat fragments of questions asked to you? Frag? No, no. That's good to hear. Now, I've gotten everything straightened out Earthside, but I'm still getting calls from Mars Base 2. Long calls that bitch Lisa will not shut up. Tell me about it. What? Um, uh, n nothing, nothing. Well, where are you? Mr. Sanchez, you need to get with the program. I'm en route. 
Now, will you get the job done by the time I arrive, or will I have to do it for you? I gotta go. Sanchez! Sanchez? You should have paid more attention in Sunday school. What does that have to do with anything? If you remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from Genesis. Oh, come on. And the Lord created all the creatures of the world, the air and the sea and the earth. I do not recall him creating any creatures from outer space. So if I believed in... If you Kevin, believed in the words Lisa, of one true God, anybody, you would have known from the get... I'm not talking to you, Steve. You're AWOL. Give it a rest, Lisa. I'm on the way back from Mars. The Bible that I read. Do you believe in the telephone? There's nothing about a telephone in the Bible. Kevin? Will? Lisa, anybody? This is Beth. Beth, what are you screaming about?
Who's that guy in orbit? Uh, Boris? Tell him to prepare for landing, on my authorization only. I'm ready to wrap this up and get out of here. Steve. Steve. Uh huh. Did you know that Lori was in charge of the other base where they were making the monsters? Yeah. Alex, what's taking you guys so long? We still have a couple more living quarters to search. We're having to cut our way into one. Can't so, are you two the only survivors? I don't know about Jackson. Jackson got killed by one of those things at the other base. Shit. Alex, never mind the search. Get in here and shoot these assholes. Alex? Space 2 calling the ship in orbit. Boris, do you copy? We need an emergency pickup down here. I'm prepped for landing. I just need Lori's authorization. Lori's dead. Could you repeat that last transmission? Lori is dead. Oh, I can't land without Lori's authorization. You bitch! Steve. What makes the stars glow? What? I guess you know how to fly one of these things. Mother f I am a progeny of enemy alien minds. So content to watch the stars fly by. What eat is close to planet number five. Don't let the particles get you down. Don't let the particles get you down. Human brain, it's a 
from our earliest school day recollections as children and in every classroom of the civilized world we have read and have been told about a mysterious place on the continent of northern Africa in a corner of the Egyptian desert known to us as the place of the pyramids we were taught that these colossal monuments protruding high above the Giza plateau were built some 5,000 years ago utilizing the muscle power of thousands of slaves by the pharaohs as final burial places before their journeys to the hereafter where they would take their rightful places among the gods yet curious as it may seem not one pharaoh's remains have ever been found in any pyramid could all we have learned been a colossal mistake when you discuss the the way the pyramids were built the sphinx was built you have to understand that the, the enormity of the pyramids the pyramids was more than just a grave for the pharaoh the pharaoh was a god he was the embodiment of the Is it possible that because of certain incredible physical characteristics contained in and around these massive structures, recently scrutinized by modern scientific means, that they were actually built by people of a much more advanced civilization, and one which, incredible as it may sound, existed some thousands of years before the Egyptians? the evidence is hidden within and around these enormous carved stones and it is overwhelming the idea that there was a super civilization just just doesn't hold water it just uh, the pyramids of the first dynasty were crude pyramids pyramids of the 18th dynasty were more intricate even the first to the fourth were Khafru and uh, Khafri and Khufu, you can see the improvement. If there was a if there was a, a, a super civilization, it would have been super at the first dynasty and not later on a natural progression of, of intelligence. The head of a man, the body of a lion. It stands majestically facing due east with overpowering impact. From a frontal view, it seems to be the guardian of all that exists behind it, as if to say to the visitor, beware, I have the intelligence of a human, and I possess the power and ferociousness of the king of the jungle. 66 feet in height, 240 feet long, with broad shoulders some 38 feet wide, entirely carved in its place from hard limestone rock in one piece. Over the centuries, it has withstood climatic changes as well as constant probing and prodding by thousands of writers, scientists, historians, looters, and theologians. Some of these intruders even tried to restore it with huge blocks of stone when it became withered and eroded. At one time, it even had to endure being painted totally red. Yet it still remains a puzzle, with dozens of pieces waiting to be put in place. The permanent disfigurement of the face was done by a religious fanatic who had hoped that this act of vandalism would in some way right the many wrongs committed by all of mankind. The Sphinx, translated by many to mean father of terror, is also referred to by the Arabs as Abu al-Hol, has often been neglected and abandoned so that sand driven by the wind would fill in the huge dugout canal surrounding its entire body. Sometimes these sand drifts would reach up to its neck, allowing anyone to easily walk up to its face. Yet he sits quietly with a regal attitude, his powerful feline body supporting his face and pharaoh-like headdress, challenging all to find out why he exists, 
What mysteries surround him? What messages he might possess that could possibly change mankind's history as we know it? Points. He reconstructed images of the Sphinx, and when compared to other faces of Pharaohs and that of Khafre, concluded that the face of the Sphinx was definitely that of Khafre. While it is difficult to argue with thousands of wire dots in stereoscopic photography, accompanied by photogeometric guidance, Closer, more logical analysis tells us what the professor did in order to reproduce the face of the Sphinx was to conform all this technology in order to mold the face of Khafre from the statue and superimpose it onto the existing face of the Sphinx. This process could also have been applied to almost any face. For instance, Napoleon. or even George Washington. Other possibilities have to be considered. Could not any person have recarved the face of the Sphinx centuries before when he found it sitting in the desert with sand up to its neck? Could not Pharaoh Khafre himself, upon viewing this magnificent structure already existing, determined that its presence possessed the power and godlike posture he wanted for his own image, and thus order its re-sculpture to reflect himself. Another possibility, since the head portion seems so disproportionate to the rest of the body, one assumption would be that the head was originally much larger and that of a lion. In many Middle Eastern cultures, the lion is linked to 
the solar strength of the gods. A New York forensic expert brought to Egypt ventured an opinion. After applying certain drawings and various schematics, tools he had used for many years successfully identifying the remains of criminals and victims, concluded that the two faces carefully examined in his New York laboratory were definitely not the same because of certain facial protrusions. The simplest method of setting a date for a monument is that it is usually inscribed on the monument itself as to the start date or completion of construction and most important, who built it. To date, no such inscriptions have been found that indicate the actual age of the Sphinx. And certainly, the ancient Egyptians were never shy about demonstrating their accomplishments through drawings and various writings. Perhaps because these sacred places were so sacred, there was no hieroglyphs for them. They were just uh, beyond word. They were just places of worship. Uh, you know, you were going to go have a ceremony, but you wouldn't necessarily have a, a picture of the Sphinx there. Having been carved out of natural rock, geologists can only surmise its age, but with no great degree of accuracy. Simple geological estimates can vary by thousands of years. Some believe that radiocarbon technique can determine the age of an object fairly accurately. They can, but this method of dating can only be used in identifying the age of organic materials, that is to say, objects that were at one time living. In this case, the most believable method of identification would have been in writings or drawings from the span of time Egyptologists claim the Sphinx was built namely 4,500 years ago, but nothing has ever been found concerning its origin or purpose from that period. Found at Giza was a stone referred to as the Inventory Stella, which states that another pharaoh, Khufu, the pharaoh accredited with the building of the Great Pyramid, gazed upon the Sphinx. Now, since Khufu reigned as pharaoh before Khafre, it is obvious that the Sphinx already existed at the time Khafre became pharaoh. Now even the reigning Egyptologists have disregarded this epitaph by pointing out that the inventory stella, because of the style of hieroglyphics used in its scripture, was written some 1,500 years after the time of Khafre. This totally disregards the possibility that this commemoration could have been based on writings or knowledge handed down over the previous 1,500 years. But the stella that has caused the greatest amount of controversy is the one placed prominently between the protruding paws of the Sphinx itself, an inscription written on line 13 in ancient hieroglyphics was translated as the word kaf. But again, this stone was a commemoration to the pharaoh Tutmos IV, who lived 1,000 years after the death of Khafre. In recognition of Tutmos' clearing of debris and sand from around the monument, the stone further states that the Sphinx possesses great secret powers and has been here since the beginning of time. The word Kaf indicates the stone was meant to honor Khafre. But all pharaohs throughout the entire history of their rule over Egypt and in all writings and drawings always had their names inscribed inside cartouches, oblong-shaped enclosures indicating their royal and godlike status. But it has been proven that Tutmos himself had this cartouche placed around the word Kaf probably honoring the memory of Khafre as a restorer of the Sphinx some 1,500 years earlier. But in no way does this stone solidify Khafre as its originator. The Sphinx was never completed. After, after Khafre's temple was completed, or pyramid was completed, they fi did not finish the work of the Sphinx. So it was left uh, abandoned 
There was no priests for the temple. It was just abandoned for 1,200 years. And then uh, oh, Amenhotep II started having his uh, pharaonic uh, uh, ceremonies there. It came to him in a dream. It was a dream that he was lost in the desert. And he, uh, he fell asleep. And in his dream, the gods came to him and said, you know, if you, if you repair the Sphinx, I will let you live. So as soon as he woke up, he, re he re went to repairing the Sphinx and had his pharaonic ceremonies there. Looking beyond the conjectures of dissidents about the face of the Sphinx, or a withered and difficult to decipher Stella, Egyptologists have the strong and compelling argument that the Sphinx is only one part of a larger master plan that included the entire area, along with the Great Pyramid and the other pyramids of Khafre and Menekure. When, when they set up when they set up a pyramid, there was a, a whole town that developed around it. There was farms to feed, bakers to bake, brewers to brew, men in the quarry, stone cutters. There was priests afterward. There was an apparatus to, to maintain the priests afterward, you know, the feeding and, and things. So it was a, an actual city formed around this pyramid. This conclusion is well-founded because of the obvious architectural designs in place that connect these triangular structures with the various causeways and the amount of water to cause such corrosion has been established as occurring 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years before Khafre. However, if the corrosion were caused by flooding, and since the area of the Sphinx shows no signs of this water exposure, these floods would have to have reached a height of at least 50 feet. Closer examination of the flooding theory tells us that, 
because similar corrosion exists on the pyramids and limestone blocks of the temples, means the floods would have to reach over 100 feet for a long period of time, which is highly unlikely. What then could have been the source of water that caused this withering? 35 million to 65 million years ago, Egypt was underwater. By being underwater, it created all of the limestone, the gypsum, the granite, all the quartz, all the, all, all, all the sedimentary stones that the Egyptians needed to build their pyramids. While several groups of American scientists have recently been banned from close examination of the stones by Egyptologists in command of the site, it has been firmly established by them, as seen from the visitor's platform, that while water was the corroding agent, it was further agreed that it was rain and constant precipitation which bore deep into the surfaces of the Sphinx. The next question then to be answered, and certainly the most focal and essential one, needed to establish the actual age of the Sphinx, which was, when has Egypt experienced the kind of rainfall necessary to cause these peculiar patterns of corrosion so prominent on the Sphinx and elsewhere on the structures of the Giza Plateau? These patterns of rain-induced decay, as totally and fully agreed upon by noted and respected paleoclimatologists, could not have occurred in 2500 BC, but instead, the true date of construction had to be three to five thousand years earlier. The Egyptologists' contention that this great and massive work of art was sculpted 6,000 Since 1993, the authorities in control in the Egyptian government over Giza have refused to permit any more geological or seismic research done to the Sphinx. Incredibly, this decision is welcomed by many Egyptologists outside of Egypt, noted writers, professors, and scholars. Whether it be 5,000 or 10,000 years before the accepted date of construction, what is it that possessed such enormous knowledge and capability? Can we let tradition, national pride, or scholarly competitiveness keep us from learning about a power that may be buried beneath the sea or earth? Or even not from this planet? The riddle and mystery of the Sphinx 
still haunts us today. As has been described and illustrated to us in books and artists' renderings, the structures existing in the soft sands of the Egyptian desert were designed with sophisticated engineering techniques and executed by thousands of slaves brought to the site for that sole purpose. Certainly there is enough historical data that indicates powerful armies were sent by the pharaohs to distant lands in the surrounding region with great success and returning after capturing entire armies and villages. Just how they were able to organize these bodies and to successfully maneuver millions of stones and in the case of the Valley and Sphinx temples stones that varied in weight from 50 to 200 tons puts many traditional answers in doubt. Major consideration being the limited space thousands of workers had to maneuver in. Also, the final arrangements of these monoliths with such precision so as to accomplish the designed aesthetic effects and in the time periods Egyptologists tell us that it was done. Each workday would have to produce an astonishing amount of miracles. Modern day contractors admit that if they had to build these structures today using state of the art construction equipment and at the same locale, they would be faced with overwhelming obstacles, perhaps too insurmountable. Recently, a team from Japan attempted to build a small pyramid at the site of Giza with Egyptian government permission and after painstaking efforts it was unveiled. After a short time it collapsed. One possible reason they failed at it was because they didn't have the the lifetime expertise that the Egyptians had. They spent their entire life dealing with sand, building pyramids, they knew precisely what was going to happen when they did what. The Japanese didn't have that knowledge, so therefore they were just experimenting. The Valley Temple, situated just south of the Sphinx, contains 16 massive stone columns. Placed uniformly within such limited space, one would have to question how, since it is estimated that it would take 1,600 men to move each stone that weighs over 400,000 pounds. Could all these men be arranged so as to place them in such perfect symmetry that close to one another? This feat would pose enormous problems even for today's most powerful cranes, given the height and width of each stone, to be placed in the exact order they exist in. Egyptologists tell us the stones were hauled over the soft sand, utilizing a series of mounds in the desert yet no evidence of such mounds has ever been found. There also is no evidence that the Egyptians had any type of vehicle that could carry a stone weighing as much as 300 mid-sized automobiles. On the contrary, when looking up at the columns, an illusion is created that they were perfectly placed by the being, lowered from the sky, and not pulled up from the ramps on the ground as suggested by the Egyptologists. And now the columns in the temple the columns are, there's 16 of them, they weigh 400,000 pounds, and, and they're made of granite. Now, it probably took 100,000 men to move these into position, and then once they were moved into position in the exact precise thing, then they finished building the temple around it. Much the way they, much the way they did the pyramids, the pyramids was a, a, a slow process up the slopes, if there was something, the chamber that went there, then they'd put the chamber in and then build it up. Uh, so it wasn't like uh, trying to get a, you know, something big and a small, you know, a ship in a bottle. It was, they put the ship and then built the bottle around it. Another major contention of the experts is that confirmed findings of various statues and artifacts have been found in the temples. Statues that reflect the images of the pharaoh's coffrey and manicure but that doesn't prove much. When we look upon the statue of Abraham Lincoln in his celebrated memorial in Washington, D.C., do we assume he built the memorial? 
When we see paintings and statues of presidents in the White House, does that mean they built the White House? Isn't it possible the ancient Egyptians were themselves so awed by these incredible structures in their midst that they were possibly some kind of signal or gift from a higher power or from the gods themselves and were compelled to use them for religious and ritualistic purposes? By comparison to the present day visitor who has been exposed to skyscrapers and huge stone cathedrals, one could only imagine the effect this giant complex would have had on an unsuspecting traveler 5,000 years ago. Another curious question that arises from examining each structure and the various sizes of the stones used in building them is, why would anyone want to use such unwieldy huge stones, which are so difficult to manage to begin with? The talents of the masonry applied throughout the Giza Plateau demonstrates the builders had the ability to cut and fit much smaller stones with the same results, thus making it easier and quicker to complete. When you build them a pyramid, you had the big stones at the bottom, and each succeeding layer, the stones got a little smaller. At the top, where the, where the, the smaller stones started to come together, they would put a giant stone across. It was like a, oh, a, like a counterweight for the, for the sides of the pyramid. And then the top stone, they would slide up the ramp and put into place. But just at the top, you'd have the giant stone putting equal weight on the sides of the pyramid. One answer to this question is perhaps the people who created this complex, with all the tremendous amount of lifting and positioning of these huge stones, possessed such powers and capabilities that they never had to worry about moving them. Furthermore, it is probable that an undertaking of this magnitude was not new to them. When building a pyramid, first you have to realize that they have to get all of the stones to, to build the pyramid. Now when they, when they chose a spot for the pyramid, one of the deciding factors was a quarry right next to it of stone, of many stones that they could use. Also, when they finished the rough building of the pyramid, they imported the, the stones from, uh, by boat, and they had boats with several, thou or several hundred uh, beams across, and they just slide these big, huge slabs on and transport them. It's from Aswan to Giza is probably uh, 500, 600 miles by river. If the stones in the temples were taken from the Sphinx quarry, it can be assumed that the Sphinx and the temples were built at approximately the same time. And since the same erosion from precipitation of the Sphinx stones is found on the temple stones, that would date the temples thousands of years before the Pharaoh Khafre. Nonetheless, statues and artifacts definitely prove the valley temple was used for Khafre's funeral ceremony, but there is no evidence he built it. Then who did? Starting in the 1800s, certain curious depressions were noted in the sands around several pyramids. Mostly, these indentations were shrugged off as just natural geological phenomena occurring at the surface of the desert, a kind of mini-fault covered with sand. Little attention was given to them until 1993, when six boats were unearthed alongside one pyramid, not in the vicinity of Giza. This aroused more attention to these dune-like crevasses in the sand, since it has always been an accepted fact that the pharaohs believed boats, or barks they were often referred to, would be used to symbolically carry their souls to the heavens, symbolically meaning a magical or superstitious dreamlike way to transport their intangible soul to the hereafter. So symbolic were these boats or barks that many were painted on walls or handcrafted stone pieces. One was discovered even made of bricks hardly intended to be actually sailed. Finally, in 1954, a pit alongside the Great Pyramid at Giza, 
uncovered an astounding discovery. A boat, totally constructed of cedar wood, over 150 feet in length, lay dormant and partially disassembled, and assumed to be the vessel intended to take Khufu, the supposed builder of the Great Pyramid, on his final travels through the stars. The boat pits were used to transport the pharaoh from, from the present world to the netherworld. And that's what the boat pits represent. Um, sometimes there are boats there, sometimes there are not, but they were, it, the pyramid acted like a, a port authority to get the pharaoh from here to the netherworld. However, close examination of the wood on this solar craft revealed that it had spent a great deal of time in the water. It had actually been sailed. Every detail of its construction, from its bow to stern, including its tightly bound hemp, common on seafaring vessels of the time, indicates the boat was built with the intention of being used as a practical sailing craft and was definitely used as such. Why, one would ask Pharaoh Khufu, use a huge functional sailing ship for so ethereal a voyage as traveling through space? And if Khufu did build the Great Pyramid as his final resting place, as asserted by Egyptologists and graded correct on any classroom test, would he put his treasures and personal belongings inside the pyramid and leave such an important item as his sole vehicle to the hereafter outside the pyramid? Could not his architects and engineers design a place inside this huge structure, protected by millions of tons of stone? Is it because Khufu, known also in Greek as Cheops, did not build the Great Pyramid? The entire development at Giza, including the Sphinx, the temples, causeways, various grave sites, and the six smaller pyramids, seem to evolve and focus around the three larger pyramids. The Great Pyramid attributed to Khufu or Cheops, the second largest Khafre, Khufu's brother and successor to his brother's throne, and the third Menekure, the son of Khufu and supposed builder of the third and smallest of the three. All were pharaohs of the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom that ruled Egypt 4,500 years ago. The dimensions and difficulties surrounding the construction of these enormous and meticulously executed structures are mind-boggling, as are the explanations for them given by the Egyptologists. These are not just piles of stones stacked one upon another with the sole purpose of creating a three-dimensional triangle intended to be used as tombs, but rather surveyed, designed, and engineered marvels that signal greater purposes and intents. The Great Pyramid, reaching over 450 feet to the sky, about the height of a 45-story office building, contains some 2,400,000 solid blocks of stone. These blocks range in weight from 2 tons to 52 tons, or over 100,000 pounds each. One would assume the larger blocks were utilized at the base of the pyramid for support, and gradually smaller used as it rose to its final height. They took the rough, rough stones from the quarry, local quarry, like uh, that were huge as the base, and then they would level the base. And they had the rudimentary tools, plumbers' plums and stuff to, to level level off the base so it was even. And then each succeeding row up, the rocks got a little smaller. Whenever there was a space, they would fill it in with, uh, oh, like. Uh, uh, granite chips, mud, straw, rope, whatever they had, they would fill in the cracks to form a, a surface. And then the outer casing would be the Torah limestone. The Torah limestone is, the, is the, like the elite. It's the best, best stone. It lasts the longest, which is why the pyramids seem to last longer than the Sphinx, per se, because the, the pyramids had the casing and the Sphinx didn't. Not so. 
there are literally several hundred thousand stones placed in extensive rows and in perfect positions over 100 feet above the ground and weighing from 10,000 to 30,000 pounds. How many men making use of what type of gear 4,500 years ago could accomplish such a Herculean task? Egyptologists explain that it took 100,000 men with the use of huge mounds and dirt ramps just 20 years to complete. Added to the problem of putting these huge stones in perfect symmetry on the pyramid itself is that of assembling and carrying the monoliths from a quarry to the construction site. When they were building the pyramids, they would build giant canals and bring the Nile closer to the pyramid. This way it would ease the transportation of rock and particularly the big giant rocks from, from Tor or, or Aswan. So they would build these canals and the boats would come up. These aren't the same boats as the boat pits. The boat pit is a different, that, that's leading to the end of the world, but these they would bring the supplies closer to the pyramid. One can only imagine the problem of juggling these various sized stones to be in perfect order for their use. It would be hardly practical to move a 20,000 pound stone around several times with the method given because it was misplaced at the site. Assuming the Egyptologists are correct and 20 years for completion is accurate means that for 7,300 days and well over 2 million stones working 24 hours per day, about 14 stones per hour at an average weight of 5 tons placed in perfect order, comes to about 150,000 pounds of stones per hour. As to the supposed ramps that were used, and at the rate the stones had to be precisely fitted, along with the tons of stones waiting to follow, would require, as the pyramid grew in width and height, a ramp as tall as the pyramid itself, and about three times the size of it. As these mounds of dirt grew with the progression of the pyramid and encircled it, how could anyone be sure the stones were placed correctly? What must be taken into account at this point is that the peak of the pyramid is exactly in a direct line with the center of the pyramid at the bottom.
protracted period of time, possess the technological instruments or the experience to accomplish such a massive and difficult undertaking. There are certain tools that we've found. We don't know what their use is per se. There is a there is a thing that looks like a pulley with with two grooves two grooves in it. Now we don't know if this was actually used for to rope to pulley up the blocks or you know, what it was used for. But there are certain tools that we know they used. There was copper in the cyanide, so we know they used copper tools to to hammer and, and hammer out the brick and stuff. The technology required for such a task would have taken hundreds of years to develop, and the speed with which it was done would have demanded an enormous amount of knowledge in executing such a venture. Egyptologists can keep reminding us they had all the slave labor they needed in whatever necessary numbers, but the technology is so sophisticated in its application that it had to take much more than dirt rafts and mounds to execute. They would have to have at least working blueprints, per se, of like, uh, you know, angles and measurements and stuff, because we know that the, the stuff was so, so exact, so, you know, even that they had to have some kind of uh, mathematical, uh, you know, tools that they used and, and, and plums and angles and stuff. The only, the only writings we have are, are like, for instance, on, on the wall of the temple. The wall of the temple wouldn't have the actual constructing of the pyramid, it would have the deeds of the pharaoh, his battles, his, you know, his children, his, that, that kind of thing. It wouldn't have the, necessarily the actual physical construction. The officially accepted reason for the existence of these pyramids was that they were to be used as tombs, and tombs only. Why all this precision if it was merely to bury the mummified body of a pharaoh, never found in any pyramid, along with his prized possessions? I think the reason there are no bones of the pharaoh inside the pyramid is because they were either taken out by grave robbers or they were taken out by the next pharaoh in line. A lot of times they used uh, the material of one pyramid to build another pyramid. Sometimes there were grave robbers that went in there and because of the, the richness of the pharaoh's uh, uh, you know, household uh, jewels and stuff, uh, they took the entire thing. They would replace them with uh, bull, bones of a bull. That was uh, a, a, a common practice because the bull represented the pharaoh in the netherworld. They would replace him with a bull and take his bones out. Where they went, no one knows. But To the naked eye, much of these builders' nightmares would go unnoticed. Could it be there is a higher purpose for their existence? hidden somewhere in these monuments, and that the as yet unidentified true builders of the Great Pyramid had little difficulties in accomplishing this mysterious wonder of the world. One is reminded that there are other pyramids in Egypt attributed to pharaohs before and after the Fourth Dynasty, namely the Third and Fifth Dynasties. However, these pyramids, some at Sagara, were in all cases nowhere as precisely built as those at Giza, and are falling apart. Sneferu, Khufu's father and the first pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, is credited with building the Bent and Red Pyramids at Dashur, which is really baffling, since Sneferu seemed to think he needed two burial places. Isn't it possible the pharaohs, upon viewing these great structures, attempted to reproduce them, and met with the same failure as the team from Japan? The pyramid built by Sahur, a pharaoh who lived less than 100 years after Khufu, is almost totally collapsed. Is it plausible that this expertise and technological know-how was lost in less than a century? The beauty and majesty of the complex on the Giza Plateau is undeniable and will never cease to overwhelm the viewer emotionally or spiritually. So why tamper with it? Why test the presently accepted facts of its existence? Why explore all its mysteries and unanswered questions? Because it challenges the most basic doctrine of knowledge accepted by mankind, 
that the people of this planet have advanced from primitive beings to our present day condition in a chronologically and carefully documented manner. The discovery of a much more prolific civilization existing thousands of years ago, whether buried somewhere on this planet or out amongst the stars, opens up whole new vistas that can tell us where we were and very possibly where our present day civilization is headed. The question of whether there was a super race or intelligent society prior, it, I don't believe so. The Egyptian people, through their daily use of, of sand and stone and pyramids and, and, and that life, the, the pyramids of the first dynasty are crude compared to the pyramids of the 18th dynasty. Each year, millions of visitors enter the somber ambience of a Gothic cathedral. Some are pilgrims seeking religious gratification. Others are tourists led on excursions to unique locales, while still others are attracted to what is usually the most dominant and awesome site in any village or city in which they exist. Though not necessarily members of its religious sect, all who enter are compelled to marvel at the ingenuity and reverence dedicated to a power or being greater than themselves. While we may revel in the thought that here in this house of God we are experiencing feelings of piety and sanctity, Close examination of the content and history of these complex edifices are often shocking. The mysterious messages that emanate from them, messages from the dark ages, ignite our imaginations and make us realize these are more than just places of worship. Gothic architecture, uh, the Gothic cathedral, is very much a product of, of a social change in the 12th century. Uh, money was coming back into common use. For much of the early Middle Ages, barter was the norm. Now we have money, solid wealth. We have a merchant class, a middle class. And for the first time, we have real cities in the modern sense. The Roman city was an administrative center. Um, the Roman Catholic Church continued that in the Middle Ages, but now in the 12th century, the city is, is a, a living, thriving organism centered on commerce. And we have very wealthy merchants, and one of the ways they want to express their newfound wealth in the city is to build a bigger, better cathedral than the next city down the road.
For centuries, following the spread of Christianity through Europe, the people were instilled with the idea that God was the most important force in their lives. If prosperity and a good life were granted to them, it was a kindness bestowed upon them from God, and it was their obligation to thank Him. In the event they suffered, it was most certain that God was punishing them and that therefore they should beg for His forgiveness. At the start of the 12th century AD, about the time the Crusades were beginning to fade, wars in Europe were coming to an end. And when the devastating plague that inflicted a cruel death on millions of people had subsided, there came a period of awakening that gave birth to a need among thriving merchants, farmers, and townspeople to give thanks to God. Since the church was their avenue to spiritual and religious guidance, they showed their gratitude by setting out to build magnificent cathedrals, structures that towered over them far above anything they had ever seen or built, and situated in relationship to their communities so that the domination of these houses of the Lord could not escape them in their daily lives. Because the cathedral was the center of the city physically, uh, it also tended to be the center of activities in the city. So while the priests were um, saying the mass, uh, all sorts of things could be going on in the background. Dancing, singing, uh, shooting craps. Um, one of the early printers uh, William Caxton had his print shop set up in a side chapel in Westminster Abbey. So there's this tremendous amount of activity going on, much of it disapproved of by the church. Nonetheless, it goes on while the priests are saying the Mass. The cathedral became the center of all religious, moral, and political activities in the town and was overseered by a bishop, the most powerful church figure in the area. Throughout Europe, Spain, Italy, Germany, England, and initially and most abundantly France, giant monoliths sprang up in dozens of communities with similar architectural conformity and grandeur, built by hundreds of engineers and artisans that had never ventured into such ambitious undertakings. But if all these contributors toward the erection of the Gothic style of cathedral were so pure of purpose, why the presence of figures detailing the dark sides of the universe, along with seedy depictions of hell and the prominent displays of the basest activities men and women could participate in? Was it because the architects and builders of these unusual structures were influenced and guided by a secret and mysterious organization that had its own agenda? The basic concept of a Gothic cathedral is that it is a ship designed to bring one closer to the heavens. Its overall design in width, length, 
and shape is such that it follows precisely the basic elements found in ancient sailing vessels, except on a grander scale. Flying buttresses emulate a ship's hull, and the frontal towers recreate the captain's and navigator's posts at the stern. The long, sleek sides give a sensation of motion. But the most intriguing part of the cathedral's construction are the vaults that support the ceilings throughout the interior. These vaults are crisscross in design and had never before been utilized by their builders. No evidence of their existence prior to the cathedrals has ever been found in Europe. Their function is exceptionally successful. The overall visual effect created by them is both eerie and majestic. But most important, they are a clue as to the origin and deeper purpose of these mysterious edifices. One of the really distinctive features of Gothic architecture construction is the so-called groined vault, or, or the vault that instead of being a perfect semicircle comes to a slight point. Uh, who invented it and where, no one knows. But in architecture preceding Gothic, people were beginning to use what was called a ribbed vault. And this was a semicircle, but it stood out from the rest of the curvature of the arch, and this is the beginning of the Gothic groined vault. Upon entering a Gothic cathedral, one is surrounded by the sudden absence of light. The frightening effect of this total darkness, symbolic of our inner being prior to experiencing the presence of God, is soon alleviated as the second set of doors open. Proceeding towards the altar, one is soon bathed in a labyrinth of light of every imaginable color and formed in the shape of various size beads emanating from stained glass windows high above. Advancing further down the center aisle to the altar, the light becomes brighter due to larger and larger numbers of stained glass windows until the final moment at the altar when one's spirit and enlightenment is totally uplifted with the presence of God. Since most of the 12th century patrons of these places of worship were illiterate, these stained glass paintings depict various stories, characters, and events from the Old and New Testaments in vivid and exciting colors with exceptional and unique artistry, thus making them both exciting and simple to understand. The more beautiful the imagery, the more beautiful the story. With each cathedral, the images and likeness vary according to the visions of the different artists. All these elements seem to make for a captivating and wonderful experience. But just as gripping and impossible to ignore are the threatening and fearful effects created by the presence of the devil and in overwhelming numbers. of the wonderful innovations of Gothic architecture were a reflection of, of a change in, in thinking in the 12th century, a move from religion as a, a dark and mysterious thing to religion as a celebration of light, a celebration of reason. 
And this still speaks to us today. Gothic architecture is still a major form of religious expression. Uh, three of the, the major churches in the United States, St. Patrick's, St. John the Divine, uh, the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., all of them are beautiful examples of Gothic architecture. They stare down at us with deep and penetrating glares, giving us the feeling that they know the dark sides of our inner selves. They seem to say, you can't hide your evil thoughts and the sinful deeds you've committed from us. No matter how pious and humble our feelings may be as we approach a Gothic cathedral, we can't escape the chilling effects cast down upon us by these unique and bizarre deputies of the underworld and its master, Satan. For the medieval world, the earth is the center of the universe. This means that heaven is beyond the outmost reaches of the physical universe. It is the Empyrean, as it's called. Now, if the Empyrean surrounds the physical universe and earth is at the center of the physical universe, this of necessity means that hell and the dominion of Satan is also embraced by heaven. So, if you are going to build a building that is a physical representation of the universe, of heaven, of the physical world, to be complete, it also has to embrace Satan and the dominions of Satan. And so we get the grotesquerie. Functionally, gargoyles act as water spouts, keeping rainwater from gathering and stagnating on the roofs and various other levels of the building, so as to avoid rotting and decay. Thus the derivative of the English verb to gargle. They come in pacts and protrude into the sky with tremendous energy and awareness so as not to be denied attention. It is said that if a needle were dropped from heaven, it would most certainly collide with one of these demons before hitting the ground. But why their existence on these most holiest of places? What secret purpose possessed the artisans and sculptors who created these monsters in the form of animals and humans, and most frequently combinations of humans and various animals? Amazingly, no two are alike. They are expressions of their individual sculptors. The explanation most given by historians and theologians is that these creatures act as a sort of scarecrow perched on the exterior of the church with the sole intention of keeping the devil and his emissaries from entering. However, this theory would demand that we accept the idea that there are good devils as well as evil ones. Nowhere in ecclesiastical writings is such a thought accepted.
This leads us to another reason given for their existence, which is that by viewing these grotesque and horrifying images before entering the cathedral, we take solace from them upon viewing the beauty and gentleness within the church. The contrast between good and evil becomes vividly apparent to us. Or is that when the patron, upon viewing the gargoyles, is forced to contemplate his own sinful behavior, and therefore compelled to beg for forgiveness within the sanctuary of the church? Or conversely, are they symbols of evil forces, such as temptations and sin, and by passing the gargoyles, the patron's safety is assured in the church? Is it that the gargoyles represent souls condemned for their sinful ways and therefore forbidden to enter the church? Their souls turn to stone as a price to pay for their sins? Are they moralistic reminders of what could happen to transgressors if they don't follow the dictates of the church? One gargoyle depicts the devil devouring an unbaptized child. Or is it possible that these demons are actually doing God's work in that they are punishing the wicked and sinful? It, it's pretty clear that the carvings and such in, in different cathedrals were probably understood differently um, by area. Um, the, the gargoyles, the grotesquerie in the Ile de France, in, in Paris, in Chartres, was probably understood a little differently than the same kind of carvings in southern Germany or in England. A and so it's not a matter of there being a meaning of, of this grotesquerie, but rather a constant reinterpretation of these figures. These are very old figures. Uh, the grotesquerie has its roots in pre-Gothic art. This is nothing new to the Gothic cathedral. And in fact, when Gothic art was first introduced, some of the cathedrals almost tried to uh, put the grotesquerie aside. But clearly, in the popular mind, it was important. And theologically, it's important. And so it remains as part of the church. While the multitude of gargoyles reign on the exterior of the cathedral, there exists in many of the churches gargoyles in hidden and unobtrusive parts of the interior. Though not functioning as water spouts, they still possess the evil and grotesque nature of their kin outside. Some interpret these as souls having been redeemed by God and therefore permitted to enter the hallowed place of worship, thus proving that God does forgive. But others more cynically believe that they are a reminder to those that assume the posture of God-fearing and obedient followers of the church, while deep in their souls lies wickedness and depravity. Finally, one theory has it that they also function in a humorous and amusing way. Because of their grotesque and grossly exaggerated reflections of various emotions and impressions, they evoke a sense of ridicule and satire. Though as macabre as this idea may seem, modern-day motion pictures and television programs have portrayed gargoyles as something to derive entertainment from. Silly buffoons prancing around making fun of people and situations while instilling only superficial fear in viewers. After all, some qualities of human nature lead us to laugh at certain aspects of ugliness and deformity in our fellow man. But the cathedrals also display a cult of gargoyle engaging in lustful and lecherous activities with humans. That the effect is both sobering and difficult to explain
present day misconception of the Middle Ages is that revelries such as singing, dancing, and especially obscenities were taboo and shunned by the populace for fear of condemnation. Not so. At the time, paganism had not yet been totally uprooted among their followers, and the clergy were wise enough to allow certain remnants of that period to ebb away rather than sever them all at once. This is evidenced by the fact that conjugal relationships between men and women, and ribaldry in general, were not heavily frowned upon. Each winter, cathedrals condone the Feast of Fools, probably an extension of the ancient pagan feast known as Roman Saturnalia. Often held on the church grounds, many paganistic events took place at these feasts. Above the entrances of many cathedrals are sculptures of the most paganistic activities. Though definitely not purient in nature, they depict the sexual act in the most debasing activities, and almost always victimize women in most of these portrayals. Interpretations of these sculptures are that they are meant to frighten women into fidelity or possibly that sex is a Satanist act, or that in hell sinners will enjoy the ultimate physical activity men can experience. The women are generally sculptured as physically attractive and emit an air of innocence. The gargoyle-like creatures in these depictions are referred to as grotesques or chimeras, Curiously, or perhaps not so curiously, modern church officials tend to ignore these sculptures and very rarely are they mentioned in church literature and never in tour guide pamphlets. Most cathedrals officials seem to have left those areas to either rot or decay and certainly never clean them with sandblasting as they do other parts of the buildings. Whether gargoyles and grotesques are there to remind man of his sinful ways or to frighten him into submission, Gargoyles of all genre and activities are irresistible and magnetic, but their macabre effects on us makes for feelings of self-degradation and despair. It is at that moment that man wants to turn to the light. The cathedral was the expression of Christ's body on earth. In the 12th century, the Catholic Church was beginning to shift its emphasis from the eternal God the Father to Christ the Redeemer, Christ God in the flesh. And so the Gothic Church becomes, on one level, a representation of the body of Christ, that is to say, God.
Certainly the most overwhelming and uplifting experience one feels in a Gothic cathedral is undoubtedly from the stained glass windows. Perhaps nowhere in the world, and in no other period of the history of art, has such beauty and mastery of a single art form appeared in such incredible numbers. Hundreds of windows painted and designed to make full use of the direct rays of the sun. A collaboration of man's talents and the universe, whose sole purpose is to uplift and enlighten. Heaven, the heavenly city, is an abstract of perfection. The physical world that we can experience in life is an imperfect reflection of the perfection of God in heaven. A and one of the ways that's beautifully expressed is in the rose window of the Gothic cathedral, the circle, eternity. And um, at Chartres, for instance, on the floor of the nave, is a, um, a maze, a labyrinth, uh, carved into the stone. And so as one would be walking this maze, turning and twisting and looping and running into the dead ends of the world, one is constantly turned again and again to look up at this magnificent rose window, the perfection of the heavenly city. So this metaphor is carried through. The central metaphor of the Gothic cathedral was the idea of light. And in fact, it wasn't really exactly a metaphor for some theologians. Um, there was the belief that light, the concept of light, was the concept of godhood. And that light, as we see it in the physical universe, is the closest expression to pure godliness that we are capable of realizing as human beings.
This is the north porch of the Gothic Cathedral at Chartres. In 1194, a great fire destroyed an existing church at this site, and the people resolved that this was a sign that Mary, mother of Jesus, wanted a more magnificent church in its place. And thus it was here that Gothic architecture was born. The dedication sculptured on this porch seemed to center around Mary and Jesus and pay homage to King Solomon, the builder of the first temple of the Hebrews. But curiously, also prominent is a statue of Solomon's wife, Sheba. Why the Queen Sheba? Since it is known that besides Sheba, Solomon had hundreds of other wives. The answer begins with the acceptance of the fact that Solomon's prime purpose in building the first temple was to house the Ark of the Covenant, undoubtedly the most coveted historic relic known to mankind, religious or otherwise. The Ark, which houses the precious slabs containing the Ten Commandments given to the ancient Hebrews by Moses, disappeared during the invasion of Israel by the Babylonians. As the Israelites were carried off to Babylonia in servitude, the priests of the temple were forced to hide the ark for fear their captors would confiscate it. But no one knew where it went, or if it was actually removed from the temple at all. It just disappeared. During the early stages of the 12th century, a group of French knights, known as the Templars, set out for the Holy Land to become part of the Crusaders that established and kept the city of Jerusalem in Christian hands. Upon arrival in the Holy City, they immediately set up headquarters on Mount Moriah, the place of Solomon's Temple, and were supposedly to protect the stream of pilgrims arriving at the seaport of Jera on their journey to the holy city of Jerusalem. They cloistered themselves from other crusaders and non-members of their order, and evidence shows that they began digging secret tunnels among the ruins of the destroyed temple, most certainly in search of the Ark of the Covenant. After extensive excavations, the precious Ark was not found but it can be assumed that many other lost manuscripts and documents, along with certain building blueprints and designs, were found. Today, at the summit of Moriah, is the Muslim Mosque of Al-Aqsa, which was once a Christian church. Here, some 3,000 miles away from the Gothic cathedrals, are vaults that are astonishingly similar, if not exact duplications of those found in the cathedrals. The men who worked on these cathedrals were moving from one place to another very rapidly. So technological advancements, artistic developments spread with amazing speed. Some of the workmen clearly were local laborers, but some of the men who worked on these cathedrals were specialists. In fact, we've got the journals of one man, uh, Villard de Onacor, uh, recorded his work on various cathedrals and uh, we know that he was a, a fine mathematician and that he was calculating uh, very carefully the geometry of of the cathedrals it's not to say that it always worked every now and then a ceiling would collapse or a wall would fall down so there was trial and error but certainly they were trying to use the new mathematics that they brought back from um, the Arabic countries after the First Crusade. Coincidentally, 
or probably not, all of these events happened at approximately the same time. The Knights also built in Palestine military structures that were uniquely designed and impregnable, techniques obviously learned in the Holy Land. As their influence and power grew, mostly because of the Church's backing of the Templar Order, their quest for the lost Ark of the Covenant never ceased. The trail led them to Ethiopia, where finally it was believed that there, where the Queen of Sheba had originated from, was the final resting place of the Ark. They believed that Menelik, the son of Solomon and Sheba, was entrusted by the priests of the temple to escape with the Ark during the time of the siege by the Babylonians. Here, on the north porch of the cathedral at Chartres, are the statues of Sheba and Solomon, and just feet away, an incredible secret revealed. On the giant stone pillar supporting the stone canopy of the porch is a piece of sculpture, just a few inches high and barely noticeable, of a cart driven by an ox and carrying what is undoubtedly the Ark of the Covenant, exactly described as in the book of Exodus of the Old Testament. Because of its relationship to the other statues of Hebrew hierarchy on the porch, the cart appears to be drawn to the statue of Sheba, and below her an Ethiopian slave attendant. Under the cart, in large letters, and in ancient Latin, are the words Arca Sideris, translated as, you are to work through the ark. On the same column, and a little further away, is a figure leaning over a similar box, and in eroded letters the inscription, Hic Amicitur Arca Sideris, or, here things take time, you are to work through the ark. Since the north porch of the cathedral was completed about 1130 A.D., and the evidence surrounding the Templars in Jerusalem were about the same time, it is probable and still under debate that there may be a connection between the two. Uh, a common figure or pair of figures in many Gothic cathedrals is Solomon and his wife Sheba. And now, some people have suggested that this has some connections to a, a a group of um, fighting monks called the Knights Templar, and, and perhaps it does. But there's another possible explanation, and that is that Solomon and his wife become the Old Testament symbols of the prince, the ideal prince or king. And so just as we're developing the idea here that um, the king of France uh, unites uh, a divine force with a secular force, so Solomon and his wife Sheba were the Old Testament precursors that suggest this melding. From the period spanning 1120 AD to 1307, nearly 200 years, the power and opulence of the Templars grew to amazing proportions though always remaining a secret society. In time, their prestige and influence took on the posture of arrogance toward all who were not members. Finally, with the combined power of the King of France and the Pope in Rome, their catastrophic demise began with a sudden and horrific stroke. On Friday the 13th, the source of that infamous date, in the year 1307, Every known Templar in France was seized and placed under arrest. The charges brought against them ranged from spitting on the image of Christ, of promoting the concept and idea of the Antichrist in accordance with the beliefs of their own secret ritualistic rites, and the widespread practice of compulsory homosexuality within their ranks. According to the charges, new initiates to the order 
were required to kiss each other in an indecent manner, most lurid of which was to place kisses on the anus of their fellow members. Coincidentally, many of the aforementioned gargoyles illustrated this type of behavior in many instances. Though many Templars suffered tortures and were burned at the stake, many did flee to nearby countries and not only survived, but flourished. It is believed that the Masonic Order that rose in Scotland was founded by one of these Templars that sought refuge in that country. Further, that the name Masonic was derived from the word Mason, so attributed to the great building capabilities of the Templars. Most people agree that, that the basic concepts of Gothic architecture um, had their beginnings in Paris uh, in a monastery uh, at the, um, the monastery church of Saint-Denis. Um, the abbot who built this, a man named Suger, was very much interested for the first time in building a building of light light permeating the interior of the church. And this was the beginning of the idea of the Gothic cathedral. Um, this monastery, however, was the traditional burial place of the ancient kings of France. And this goes back to the line of Charlemagne. Now Charlemagne himself is not buried there, but his grandfather, his father, his grandsons are all there. And so Suger, turned away from the Roman art of the time and turned back to the art of Charlemagne. And this was the beginning of the, the Gothic style of art that we see later in the great Gothic cathedrals. Sodomy, blasphemy, and adultery were the accusations made against the Templar order. And in the time of the Inquisition in Europe, little proof had to be presented before a person was condemned to a horrible fate. However, we must attribute much, if not all, of the concepts of the Gothic cathedrals to the influence of the Templars, including the gargoyles and grotesques, and the ambitious quest for the Ark of the Covenant. But much of the distortion of normal godlike values that exist on and in the cathedrals is overshadowed by the good intentions of the simple artisans of the towns and villages. The cathedrals indeed reign supreme among houses of the Lord. Just as we, the visitors, marvel at their content and awesome impact, we still can't completely solve the mysteries and unanswered questions they contain. <laughs> 